All right. Good morning, friends. It's uh, Friday. How about that? I love saying that word. Uh, so it's the weekend. It's here. Just a few hours of work or whatever you got going on. And then it's the evening. And I hope you're going to have some great times, whether it's just sitting in, uh, hanging out with somebody you love, or whether it's going out to dinner or whatever it is. But I uh, hope you have a great time and a good weekend. I was just, Tammy and I were just talking. Uh, man, I'm excited about doing whatever I want to do tomorrow, right? If I want to build some shelves, which I've been uh, trying to want to do, if we just want to go hang out, uh, maybe sleep in till 6, that would be nice. So just a lot of different uh, different options, right? Uh, the weather was, man, this morning here where we live, it was storming. And uh, I, I love it when it does that, especially, uh, you know, in the early mornings. It's just the sound and, and um, just the thunder, all of that. Love it. Uh, so... I uh, hope your weekend's going to be good. Uh, we got a lot of great stuff going on. We got church Sunday, and uh, man, I'm I'm loving that. Uh, we're in a series on Sundays looking at the Holy Spirit, and uh, right now we're in the middle of Galatians five, looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And what is it? What changes attitudinally happens as the Spirit of God begins to take over our lives? So anyway, that's that's what we're doing there. But for today, we're in the book of James, and he's shifting gears. Uh, James, man, he. He takes hard turns one way or the other. He's on a mission. He He's, as James, who, as we've talked about, is the Lord's uh, younger brother, oldest younger brother, uh, half-brother, because uh, obviously Jesus didn't have a, an earthly father in the sense of, of genetics, um, So, but, but James did. So James is pastoring the church in Jerusalem, uh, prominent, very prominent. In fact, uh, Paul calls him a pillar of the community. Uh, so, so James is uh, mid fifties, could be maybe somewhere near my age, uh, maybe he could be early sixties, but for the most part, somewhere in that range. And um, his church is scattered. It's one of those things: uh, famine came, uh, persecution came, uh, a lot of different things were happening, and so the Christians uh, began to scatter in in Jerusalem because of all that persecution. The, when they when they converted to to Jesus and what they called the way. Uh, and believed Jesus to be the Messiah, which he was, it offended the Jews, and so great persecution took place. People were no longer buying uh, your product. They would no longer shop at your at your marketplace. They would All of those things were going on. So the church had scattered just trying to find uh, life, and with it was the gospel uh, that was going forth too. So it's a powerful thing how God takes uh, what seems to be a difficulty and transforms it into something useful for the kingdom. Uh, so James is writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, and he wants them to be mindful of their faith and how our faith is to be lived out, it, it, what I like to call living out loud. Uh, people should see our faith, not, not in a showy way, but it, it just should emanate from us. So he starts off by talking about trials. Yeah, you know, they consider them joy, man. Let's rock through these things. Uh, don't, don't treat it like the world does, and don't try to buck against it and and figure ways to manipulate yourself out of it. Just plow through it because it's doing something good in your life. And he, then he talks about temptation. Hey, let's don't give in to sin. Understand how sin operates. And this is what it does. And then he talks about the Word of God. Uh, be doers of the Word. And so now we're in chapter 2, verse 1. And he makes a statement now where he's talking about our faith as it relates to how we see other people. And uh, this, if there's some convicting things, this is going to do it today. And um, I think that uh, it's evident today uh, because of, the, of just our society and where we are that the topic that we're going to talk about is extremely prevalent, even though we all like to say that we're not partakers of that. So let's just read the text. I'm only going to look at four verses today. There's a whole section of it, but we're only going to get to the first four verses. Let me just read it, and then we'll make some commentary and get on our day. My brethren, he says, and I love how he, he'll, he'll throw this out all the time. You can tell he just has this fondness for his people. Whether he sees them face to face or they're scattered, he sees them as brothers and sisters, a family, a relationship, my brethren. And I think it's important that you and me see the Christian life that way. That that uh, that whether some of you I'm, I haven't seen in years that are watching these, some of you live out of town, some of you I've never even met. Um, and and but but the reality is when you and I, by virtue of our faith in Christ, have become Christians, uh, believers, Christ followers, we're brothers and sisters. And so there's this there's this love that instantaneously should develop and. And, and it should be a part of us. Um, I got a friend in Romania, uh, Anna, and, and I, I just saw her name pop up. 
and uh, you know I've I've visited with her probably two times week week uh, uh, you know times in my life and then corresponded and uh, I love her husband Raul uh, but but she's a sister in Christ and when I see her name pop up there's just this warmth about about what goes on in Romania and this powerful I think John uh, James as he writes is my brother and has that concept of, of what it means to have brothers and sisters around the world and so it's a powerful thing that he says and so he says this my brother do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now, let me break that down for you. I, would, I do want to... Let, now, let's go on. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or you can sit down at the little stool we got over here. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? This is biting right here. Now, let's, let's break it down, and let's look at a few things first. One, God is not a respecter of persons. And I think it's important for us to understand that. The God who saved us, the God who, who is the Most High, the God who is the ruler of the heavens and the earth and everything in it. And this is what I love about him. He does not show partiality. Second Chronicles 9, 19, 7 says this, Now then let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Very carefully do, uh, for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bride. What's he saying there? God doesn't show partiality. It, it's not a part of his nature to do so. He's not a respecter of persons. I love that. The gospel is open to everyone. I like to say the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It makes no difference whether you, you're all that or you're none of that. Uh, the gospel, God loves, and it's powerful in that. Uh, Acts chapter 10, and bring it into the New Testament, it says, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right um, is, is welcome to him. What's he saying there? Hey, listen, all are welcome. I show no partiality. If you fear me and do what, do what you should do, I, we got no problem. I, I, he says, I, I love you. And, and so this is the truth that we find that, that just floats through the scriptures. Back in the, New, in the Old Testament again, Leviticus 19, uh, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, for you are to judge your neighbor fairly. This is how God wants us. He wants us to have a mindset like his so that we have an attitude that we love everybody, that we're impartial to who comes into our peripheral, who comes into our, our life. We treat with the same respect. And, and uh, so, so then he begins to, to have this conversation. So back in James, He's, and this is in, in the original language, uh, it structures things different by priority. So literally in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, My brethren, with, with the respect of favoritism, regarding favoritism. So he just jumps right at you. That's the topic he's getting ready to jump into, favoritism. Don't use faith in our Lord Jesus Christ in any way to, to embolden favoritism. Don't do it. Don't allow that to happen. See, we, we, don't, we can't afford to be partial. We can't afford to have favorites. The gospel should go forth freely. We're his ambassador. We're his messenger. That means everywhere we go, that's how we treat people. So now I know off the cuff, we like to go, well, I, I, that's easy. Cause I don't, I, man, I'm, I, I treat everybody the same. Well, maybe. But sh shouldn't we allow the word to really dig into our heart and see and make sure that, that, that that's true? And that there's not some, some falsehoods in there. So let's look at some categories that, that I think that sometimes we see. And I don't want to belabor this point. I just because I want I don't want to tell you how to think. I want you to take this message today and think about it throughout the day and the encounters that you have. How do you treat the people that you come in contact with? Does race matter to you? I mean, we all, it's easy to go, I'm not a racist. Well, okay. I mean, and the whole world's trying to tell everybody they are. But 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 are we or are we not? I mean, let's let's have that conversation. Do we treat people differently based on, on color? Do we rate them? Well, you know, the, the Asians are here and the blacks are here and the browns are here and the whites are here. Do, are, we, are we rating people like that? Because God doesn't. He's not a respecter of that. And, and even the smallest amount of doing that should really 
make us pause a little bit and go, hey, maybe I should, I need to work on that area. How, how about uh, how about looks, right? Pretty people, people that look like us, uh, you know, you know, whatever it is that we do, uh, you know, do you look at people like, mm, kind of ugly? Uh, I mean, if we start sizing people up like that, and, and granted, there are people that ha- are pleasing to my eye that may not be pleasing to yours and vice versa. So we're not saying that we don't recognize that there are, are that, but that we don't treat people differently based on the fact that that some look pretty or more attractive than others. Is, does that does that play a part? How about how about education? Some of us maybe that's the deal. You know, you look at somebody you go, you, you don't you don't even you didn't even go to college. You didn't graduate high school. Uh, from God's perspective, that doesn't matter to him. So. The point being, and he's going to belabor this a good bit in this passage, is that we have to realize that's not a choice for a Christ follower. In regards to favoritism, don't use the gospel. Don't show favoritism as you present Christ to the world, which means not in the gospel presentation, but in our lifestyle, because our life is a presentation of the gospel. Now, how about regionally? Right? I'm a good old Southern boy. So, you know, if I'm Yankee or, or uh, you know, some Cali freak or whatever whatever we would say, or maybe you're from Texas, you know, the, the greatest state in the world and and uh, whatever, you know, goes on in that whole realm. But are, are we do we do that? You know, are we saying, well, you know, Americans, they're better than everybody else or, or whatever that is, that can't be either. You, you, man, we start breaking this down, all of a sudden you're going, oh, how about housing? Right? Oh, I got the, they got a big house. Oh, they live in that neighborhood. Oh, they live in a single wide. Oh, they live in a double wide. Oh, they live, you know, in a gated community. Oh, they, right? And we begin to look at that. Oh, they live in an apartment. Oh, they're in Section 8 housing. Whatever those things are, and we start judging people based on that, we're violating the very law of love that God has for us. Um, how about money? Right? That's always a big one, right? Oh, they got money. I'm, be nice to them. They got money. Ooh, they got money, right? So we should be nice. Maybe they'll give me some, and we start thinking about that. How about politics? Oh, they're one of those. Oh, they're a donkey. Oh, they're an elephant. Oh, they're a whatever. Um, and and so we start we start looking at that and treating people differently based on that. How about power? Careful what you say about them, man. They, I mean, they can bring pressure down on you, right? You think Paul ever thought about that when he went toe to toe with? The, with, with everybody in Rome, you think he cared one bit about whether they had power to kill him or not? Um, he's like, look, man, you can kill me if you want to. That's just that's just an advantage to me. You, see, that's this is how we should. He didn't treat him any different. Uh, how about job status? You know, levels and boss. Oh, he's a CEO. Oh, he's a Fortune 500. Oh, he's whatever. Those are the areas that we and, and you probably have more. I'm just trying to point out some of those. And in James chapter uh, two, he says you can't do that. Stop it. It has no place. We've already talked about the fact that God doesn't do that, so we shouldn't either. Then, so now he gives us an example. He says, For if a man comes into the assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, it is interesting that they would wear lots of rings, and they meant things uh, back in those days, different rings that the men would wear, different fingers that they would wear them on, uh, all meant certain things. And so he would say, You see, someone come in, they got, they got certain rings on, you know, their fraternity rings or whatever. And you see, they got some man. That guy's got it going on. I mean, he's shopping. He didn't shop at uh, he didn't shop at Walmart for those clothes. Uh, and and then and so you you see them. You recognize that and immediately. You categorize. Okay, somebody that I want to treat differently. Oh, there's another man. He comes in. He's a poor man in dirty clothes. And uh, you know, you uh, he kind of stinks. Um, and so you've got these two to walk through the doors of your church, and you go, okay, which one are you going to gravitate to first? Which one are you going to gravitate to first, right? That's the question that we have to ask. Now, obviously, we have to choose one over the other. That's not the issue, but why? Why was the choice? And in so doing, how do we treat them once we've had these introductions? And he says, if you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? and become judges with evil motives. Now, distinctions, we, we make those distinctions, right? I mean, you recognize a woman. You recognize an older person, right? You, you give up your seat for an older person. You give up your seat for a, a woman if you're a guy. Those kind of things. You give preference. You make a distinction, hey, that's a child. Let's, let's be more gentle. Let's, right? I mean, we do those things. But 
What's our motive behind what we do? And James is saying it's evil if it's if it's for any reason other than the gospel's sake. It's just evil. This is this is what he says. So we have to ask ourselves these questions. Uh, you know, what's my motive behind why why I, I defer to that or why I have and, and how about my circle of friendships? What why do I have the circle that I have? And there's a lot of reasons. And I'm not meant it's not meant to say that we can't have close friends. Jesus had those, right? I mean he he had a twelve and he had within the twelve he had three and within the three he had one. There there were those things, but not for evil motives. And and, and so this is the question we have to ask ourselves. And I think it's important to be mindful of the fact that when the church was started, it wasn't full of all of the rich and the wealthy and the mighty and all of that. Do you remember that in Acts chapter 2? You know what they were doing? Some of those who had means were selling properties and different things to gain some cash to help feed those who couldn't feed themselves because they had lost their job. So who was it that, that really birthed the kingdom? Who, what was, who was it a part of? Who was it to? Well, it was the, a lot of the poor. In Acts chapter 6, the, the church is complaining, and there are people going, hey, hey my, uh, the, my widows, the, the widows that are in my, the Hellenistic Jews, they're not getting the same food that, that the other Jewish ladies are. And in those days, there were two types of Jews. There were Jews who grew up within the, the Jewish culture.